right, you are at Journey Church. Come on, Jesus, help us out here today. So, so today we're going to be bringing our Freedom Series to a close. Uh, we're continuing our conversation today surrounding being filled with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Next week, we're going to be kicking off a brand new series called Love Thy Neighbor that will lead us right into Easter. And we'll be answering a couple questions during that series, the first and foremost being, who is your neighbor? You know, we've lost that art of neighboring, have we not? Um, we were reminiscing at our house yesterday. My, my youngest daughter was with us, and we were talking about not too long ago when they were kids running around in Eagle Harbor. They were out there on the playgrounds. They were hanging out, meeting other kids, and we knew all the parents who lived near us. And sometimes that was a good thing, and sometimes that was a bad thing for anybody who grew up in that day and age. But, man, we need to know our neighbors. And who is your neighbor? It goes beyond your physical neighbors. And includes your family, your coworkers, and others. How can we share the love of Jesus with them in real and practical ways? So that's what that series is going to be about. I hope that gets you excited because I believe that God wants to reach some people in our backyards. And I believe that he wants to use you to do that. In our Freedom Series... For those of you who have been here throughout it and those who have maybe started here at the beginning of the year, hopefully as you're applying these things, God's moving and you're seeing him do some things in your life. Is anybody's life starting to change just a little bit? You're getting these principles, you're applying them in your life. I think of the verse where we started, Galatians 5.1. It says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Man, let's not go back there. If you've closed some chapters in your life during the course of this series, don't reopen them. Don't allow the devil to come back in and get a foothold once again. Walk it out in might and victory and watch what God does in the days ahead. If you happen to miss any of those messages, you can go online to our Journey Church app or go to journeychurch.org. I heard I met some people who were here for the first time today who had actually been watching online. It works, people. God uses our online campus to reach people. For those of you who are watching live right now, God bless you guys. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. In fact, why don't we stop right now? How many of you actually have these things called cell phones? I guess smartphones. You still have one with you right now? If you have one right now, let's use it to counter some of the bad we see on social media. Maybe go on Instagram or Facebook right now. Let your friends know you're here at Journey Church and tell them they could join you by going to journeychurch.org and clicking watch live. Only like five of you are doing that. You get the best evangelistic opportunity of your lifetime right now in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you and we do thank you for tools that you allow us to use like the internet and smartphones so that we could advance the kingdom of God and advance your agenda online and let people know that you exist and that you are powerful and mighty, that you have not changed, that you still touch and reach people, you still transform lives, you still empower us to live this Christian life in the midst of the onslaught of things that come against it in our own generation. So Father, we just worship you this morning and as we do, as we begin to wrap up this freedom series as we talk about the person of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we hope that you would introduce us to him today. For those who have been nervous about things that they found out about him or heard about him in the past that are not true, Lord, would they meet him as a brand new friend this very morning, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, a friend who teaches us, who guides us, who directs us, who gives us strength, who empowers us, who bestows us with gifts both in the natural and supernatural. Father, would you make his presence real to each of us today? Would you come alive in our hearts and minds? Would you touch and change lives this very morning as only you could do in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus? Amen, amen, and amen. So we are going to be talking about this subject that we started to broach last week. And I don't know where you came from, uh, if you were around Christianity for some time. Certain different camps we're going to talk about today. Some that have different viewpoints as it pertains to the things of the Holy Spirit. It seems that nobody is concerned about the person of the Holy Spirit, but some people get a little freaked out about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? So we want to demystify that a little bit. We want to de-spookify the person and presence presence of the Holy Spirit, let me tell you by the end of the message, if you have not already come to that realization, you will want his presence in your life. In fact, you can't live as a believer without his presence in your life. You just are not going to make it in this world that we live in. Can I get an amen from some people out there in the body? 
So two weeks is not enough to cover this subject material. In fact, um, the last time we covered it in great, great detail goes all the way back to 2009. The message is still out there online on our app. You're welcome to go back there. We preach six messages back to back on the person, the presence, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So if you want an in-depth study of that, I encourage you to go back to that message series. But today we're going to talk about this God who loves us so much that he not only sent his one and only begotten son that we could have life and then have it abundantly. He gives us this promise of the person of the Holy Spirit. So there's two main viewpoints. I'm not going to overly dwell on them, but it's important as believers that you understand where people come from as it pertains to this particular subject. I want you to come with an open mind today. Don't believe what one camp or the other says in particular. Guess what? God meant one thing in his word. In our humanity, sometimes we're the ones who mess it up. God didn't mess it up. We're the ones who mess it up, right? He meant one thing in his word, and the only way you're going to really figure that out is get deep in God's word to know him, to know his presence. It says his sheep know his voice. We need to spend time with him and know who he is. But what are those two primary positions as it pertains particularly to the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Everyone would agree we need the person of the Holy Spirit. People get a little nervous when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the first camp is called the cessationists. They believe that the gifts of the Spirit ceased to function when the last apostle died. That is their position. We'll talk about it a little bit more. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if you were to get to the other end of the extreme on the charismatic side, it would be the Pentecostals. How many of you came from a Pentecostal church? Anybody came from a Pentecostal church? How many of you came from a more conservative background? A few of you? All right. So you guys will be really scared today. You guys will think I didn't go far enough. It's all good. We're going to be there somewhere right in the middle. We're going to bring some rationality to this subject, but also embrace, hopefully, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So one of the dangers in the gifts of the Spirit is they can become an idol. They can become the object of worship. We could begin seeking out an experience rather than seeking out the person who is God. So we're not, I mean, it's lovely when we have those experiences. Praise Jesus. Those are wonderful, wonderful moments, but we shouldn't be seeking out that experience as an object of worship. Here's what I would say right from the beginning. I'll start to let the cat out of the bag about where I sit. I believe we do not serve a dead God. I believe that we do not serve a God who you could put in a box. God is a box breaker. We serve a God who is alive, a God who is mighty, a God who is powerful, and a God who, if we believe all that we've been learning of late, and we've talked about this from the beginning of the year, we live in a world that is at spiritual war. We live in a world where there is a real enemy. We live in a world where angels and demons are real. Powers and principalities and heavenly places are real. Spiritual warfare is real. Why would God leave us without weapons of warfare to be able to fight this spiritual battle that still exists? Hopefully I can get an amen. Amen? So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 do a beautiful job highlighting the gifts of the Spirit, both natural and supernatural. And we're going to talk about some of those today. He starts out, Paul does, I think in a beautiful way. He says this, now concerning the spiritual gifts, brother, I do not want you to be uninformed. He's telling us right from the jump, I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be unaware. I want you to have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that you can apply in your lives on the subject that I'm about to talk about. I stand here as Paul did today too and say, I do not want you to be uninformed. What does he not want us to be uninformed about? The spiritual gifts. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So in order to utter the phrase, Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit has to be at work in your life. So we're going to start to talk about, is there one infilling? Is there two infillings of the Holy Spirit? Is there one baptism? Is there two baptisms? But you must know from the beginning what I hinted at last week. When you are saved, you receive the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit at salvation, right? Does that make sense to you? It says you cannot say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 
right? But guess what? We all know people that walk in power, and we know people who don't walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So what's the difference? It comes down to this thing called gifts of the Spirit. And you want the gifts of the Spirit. I assure you, you want the gifts of the Spirit. If you have not heard about them, I, I don't want you to be uninformed any longer. Man, may the Lord bestow these things on us this very morning. So at salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit, right? You can't say Jesus is Lord without the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So now what happens if you go back in Scripture and you look at verses like Acts chapter 19 starting in verse 1, it says, And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Who are disciples? Are you a disciple? Are you a believer in Jesus, right? He found some believers in Jesus. He found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. They were uninformed on the subject. They didn't know. They didn't understand. The goal of the Bible is to give us information that leads us to transformation. God doesn't just give us knowledge for knowledge's sake. He wants us to be transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation, in our lifetimes, right? So many people, including our own generation, don't know a great deal about the Holy Spirit. And sadly, more often than not, many Christians don't even exhibit the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You heard me. Come on. <laughs> right? We can be some grumpy people. You can be the biggest tongue-talking, Bible-thumping, tithing Christian and still be nasty, and I don't want to even be around you in Jesus' name, right? So we need to function in the gifts and the calling of the Holy Spirit, but also in the fruits of the Spirit, as you will see, are vitally, vitally important. So the other half of the debate, is there one infilling or is there two? We talked about no one can say Jesus is Lord without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Let's go on and bring a conclusion to this debate. Acts 19 and 3. Into what then were you baptized? They said into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. When we're saved, we repent and are saved, right? We repent and surrender our lives to Jesus. We're baptized into the family of God. Water baptism, something different. We talked about that last week. Telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is in Jesus. They believed in Jesus. They were disciples of Jesus. And then on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They gave their lives to Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. So there was this second infilling, second baptism, this pouring out of power. I don't care what you call it. I'm being completely honest with you. I don't want to get into debates about is there one baptism, is there two baptisms, is there three baptisms, is there no baptisms? Come on, Jesus. That stuff doesn't bear any fruit at all. All I want to know is can you walk in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit or not, right? There's clearly a number of people who are saved and do not take advantage of the power of the Holy Spirit. They walk a defeated life even as believers. Yes, you are saved. You've got your heavenly fire insurance. But that's not why God saves you. He saved you to point people towards Jesus. He saved you to make a difference in this life and into eternity. He saved you to be a part of this spiritual battle that's in heavenly places that surrounds us. And to do that, you have to be endued with spiritual power from on high. Who is the one who breathes spiritual power into you? The Holy Spirit, right? The creator of the heavens and the earth is at work inside of you. You as a believer in Jesus Christ are powerful. Why do you think in other scriptures it says, you will do greater things than even he did? Is that crazy to think about? How is that even possible? It's possible by numbers. Jesus, by his own will, constricted himself to a particular place and time, right? He could only reach the people that he could touch at that time by his own choosing, right? He could have certainly gone well beyond that. But by releasing the power of the Holy Spirit into each of us, we can certainly change Jacksonville in Jesus' name, right? We can go out there and make a difference and go well beyond that. So let's go back. One more clarity. I think I talked about it last week. So one thing that Pentecostals do 
um, in some cases, there's some camps of them, they believe that the evidence of salvation is speaking in tongues. I would not believe that in any way, shape, or form, and think, I think I'll actually make a case for that right now. So some of them would say, if you do not speak in tongues, you are not saved. I'd venture to say the majority of the people in this room probably do not speak in tongues right now, but I hope the majority of you are saved in Jesus' name. See, speaking in tongues is a beautiful thing, but it is but a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is not the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is greatly abused, thus many people are turned off by it. Because in many circles, it is abused. Has anybody ever been there in that service where it's been abused, right? In many circles, but that don't mean it's not true. There's a lot of stuff in life that's greatly abused, but it's still true, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Remember earlier, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of these things. He says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So why would one be endued with spiritual gifts either naturally or supernaturally? It is for the good. It is for pointing people towards Jesus, not pointing people toward ourselves. And then he says, for one, it is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. So to one, maybe she receives the gift of wisdom. Somebody else receives another gift. Some people get more than one gift. Aren't we all jealous right now in Jesus' name, right? So it says, so the spirit, utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another by the same spirit, another gift of healing by one spirit. How many of you want to have the gift of healing operate through you? Holy Spirit's gift working through you. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. And to others, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions each one individually as he so wills. Some people get many of the gifts. Some people get one of the gifts. Not everybody gets tongues. Here's where I see that abuse in that because I've seen so many people come up to me and it is good. You're going to read in just a moment. It says, earnestly desire the greater gifts. Earnestly desire these things. What does that mean? Earnestly desire the greater gifts, right? Earnestly desire these supernatural spiritual gifts. It's something that you should do and rightly so. But I've seen so many people walk up, Eric, would you pray for me to receive the gift of speaking in tongues? And then they don't speak in tongues and they're disappointed like God didn't give me a gift. Oh my God, this is horrible. Maybe the gift he had for you was wisdom. Maybe the gift he had for you was the interpretation of tongues. Maybe the gift he had for you was something completely different. Maybe it was something in the natural that he gave you some unique skill and ability that was not necessarily supernaturally manifested that gives you great wisdom in business or something like that. All of these things are gifts of the spirit. Is that not what we just read? whether they're natural or supernatural. So guess what? In a few minutes, we're going to be praying again. We're going to be singing again. And I want to encourage you, as you're going to read in just a moment, earnestly desire the greater gifts. The fact of the matter is you can ask him for certain things, but maybe for your own good, he may give you something different than you asked for because he's a good daddy. We don't put certain things in our kids' hands that are not good for them, even if they want it sometimes, right? So he says, earnestly desire these things, as you'll read in just a moment. I pray that he would give us the gift of speaking in tongues. I pray that he would give us all of these gifts if done in decency and order. That's why at Journey Church, we say we have two rules. I want you to be as charismatic, as Pentecostal, as fired up as you want to be in here with two rules. Don't do anything to draw attention to yourself or be a distraction to others. Because if you read on in Corinthians, it talks about the order of service where these spiritual gifts are manifested. And it says, guess what? Anytime the gifts of the Spirit are manifested, it's to point people to Jesus, not make some spectacle of ourselves, right? Is this making sense to you as you start to hear it? Is this making a little more sense to you this morning? But man, I pray that we would operate in all of these things. I lost myself. Hallelujah. So, If all that we've been learning is true, why would the gifts cease if you go back to that other camp? What do they say? Here's the main argument that they make against it. Here's the particular verse that's usually used in opposition to the points that I've been making. If you read on in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, Love never ends. As prophecies, they will pass away. And as for tongues, they will cease. 
As for knowledge, it will pass away, for we know in part and prophesy in part. Now, they're perfectly comfortable if people get the spirit of wisdom, but when it comes to tongues, come on, Jesus, you ain't going to get none of that. The partial will pass away. For when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, I shall know fully. How many of you know fully? Nobody better raise their hand right now in Jesus' name, right? Even as it's been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these things, but the greatest of these is love. Why do we see in a mirror dimly? Because Jesus has not returned. Think about that for a moment. When the perfect comes, it says, has the perfect come again? All these gifts were taking place after he was already gone for the first time, right? So when the perfect comes, these gifts will cease. That means when we go to heaven, when Jesus comes back, whether you believe in the rapture or don't believe in the rapture, whatever, when the end comes... Guess what? When you're in heaven, you ain't going to need to speak in tongues no more. You're not going to need this kind of supernatural wisdom because you're going to be in the presence of wisdom. So we know in part, we see in part, some of these things are hard to understand. They're freaky. They're weird. They go against what we consider science. But thank God they do because I was an addict headed to hell, going in the right direction, couldn't overcome my addiction until I was touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he began to transform me. We can't put God in a box. You can't put God in a box. So the main question is, has the perfect come? No, the perfect comes when Jesus returns. There's also a caution. Listen to this one. 2 Timothy chapter 3. There are groups of people that have the appearance of God, but deny his power, avoid such people. Do you think there could be a conspiracy to restrict the person, presence, and gifting of the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't it be just like the devil to try to remove the tools that you have to combat him? Does that not make more sense to you if you start to really think about it? He says, avoid those people, those people who are telling you the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit isn't good. No, you got to be scared of that. So why can't we be a beautifully balanced group of people who love God with all our hearts, strength, soul, and mind, believe in the gifts of the Spirit, live them out in decency and order in a way that does not bring division? Could we be a people that do that? I think we can. Some of you are like, yes. The rest of you are like, I am not coming back next week. I do not know what he is talking about. Maybe I need to say that again. When you think of those two camps... And you go one direction or another. Why can't we, as Journey Church, be a balanced group of people who love God with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind, believe in the gifts of the Spirit, ask God for them to be manifest in our lives, and then live them out in decency and in order in a way that does not bring division, right? Hallelujah. Let's focus on the main things. i got just a couple more sets of verses, and then we're going to worship one more time. A lot of scripture for you here today. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in his church apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gift of healing? Do all speak in tongues? There you go. That kills that one argument, right? Do all interpret, but all earnestly desire the greater gifts or the higher gifts, and I will still show you an even more excellent way. Why would God tell you to earnestly desire something you cannot have? I'm being very basic here, but just think in your humanity. Why would God tell you to earnestly desire something you cannot have? Everybody's really quiet in here today, like, because they're real. Because they'll make a difference in your life. Because he loves you, and as a good daddy, he wants to give you good gifts. He just wants you to use them with decency and order. Amen? Amen. He'll speak to that a lot more later. And then he gives us this one reminder for all of us as Christians to bear the fruit of the Spirit in love. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. He speaks in normal language and in tongues but I have not loved. He's assuming this is normal, people. 
Am I a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal? And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned and I have not loved, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love is where we need to land on all of these things, even if people believe something different than we, we, than we do. God will sort all that out in the end, will he not? But man, let us embrace who we are. Let us live out what God's called us to do. Let us walk in the power and anointing and presence of the Holy Spirit. Let him work in our lives and watch what he does as long as we buffer it in love, right? Maybe some people need to get more excited about that. Come on, Jesus. Here's my last one, my last case for this. I'm going to only speak the first one. Band, you can begin to come back up. Pursue love, and he uses this word yet again, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. So here's what I'd ask of you today. I believe God wants to pour out some of his supernatural gifts on you today. I truly do with all my heart. I believe he wants to endue us as believers with power from on high so that we can live this Christian life. It may not come in the box or form that you expect. But maybe God's put something on your heart like, Lord, I would love to have more wisdom. I would love to understand and discern things that I could prophesy. Lord, I would love for you to give me a spiritual language called tongues that I could use in a way that is not weird, that does not freak people out, that I could use in balance and do with decency and order. I don't want to turn into tambourine Tammy with purple hair immediately in Jesus' name, right? Sorry for those of you who've dyed your hair in different colors. Mine's all gray now. Come on, Jesus. I need some help up in here. But, I mean, I'm here to tell you, don't shy away from the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If God wants to give you something, let him do it. Let him do it. So here's all I would ask during this next one. Have an open mind and an open heart to God, his spirit, his presence. You know, you can spend some time at the altar during this next song. Come on up here. Ask him for whatever gifts that he wants to give you. If you need to ask for forgiveness from him for trying to put him in a box and trying to say, God, you can only have me this way, or God, you can only do this in my life. I don't want you to move in this way or that way. Would you release that and smash that box this morning? Maybe some of you want to take communion by yourself or with others. I would encourage you to do that. Go with your family or by yourself and take communion to my left or my right. Let's spend a few more moments worshiping him, and then we will pray to close out the service. Would you rise with me? The altars are open. If you would like to join hands with somebody as you read in that one scripture and ask them to pray for the impartation of a spiritual gift into your life, I would be more than happy to do that. Some of our other elders and leaders will also be up here. We would love to pray for God to move in that way in your life. May he move in our presence today in Jesus' name. If I were to break down a little bit of what we learned today, I think we really talked about three things. We talked about gifts, we talked about love, and we talked about the fruits of the Spirit. All of these things are indicative of the Spirit's presence in our lives. The Bible says that God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only be, one and only begotten Son, Jesus, to die in our place for our sins that we might become part of the family of God. And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus but feel the tugging of the Holy Spirit in your heart this morning, I, like Paul in Ephesus, would love to pray for you in just a moment. We talked about the gifts of the Spirit and that we should earnestly desire them, yet they should always be buffered by the fruits of the Spirit being manifest in our lives. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Lord, we come before you and die for one. Remember the day of my salvation. Maybe we would all do that this very moment. Just remember what it was like the day that you surrendered your life to Jesus when all your sins were washed away. The Spirit came and gave you the ability to utter that phrase, Jesus, you are Lord. For some of you, this may be that day. 
Man, I pray you'll say along with me that Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. We surrender our lives to you for the first time or anew this morning. Lord, take our sins from us, remove them as far as the east is from the west, and let us never return to them. We walk out of here in freedom, closing those doors on the old chapter of our life and walking out in newness of life. And Lord, your word says, and what Pastor Eric shared today is that you have gifts that you want to bestow upon us as a good dad does. And Lord, I just pray right now, as we have read in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that you would pour out on people this very day, on some, the spirit of wisdom, on others, according to the same spirit, knowledge, faith gifts of healing, the gifts of working of miracles, prophecy, the distinguishing between spirits and other kinds of tongues, the interpretation of tongues, also these natural gifts like administration and other things that are shared in your word. Lord, I pray that people in this room would earnestly desire those things, would not resent, relent until you pour them out in their lives. And Lord, I pray that you would do that even right here, right now, that you would pour out these gifts that some would prophesy, that some would speak in tongues, but all would be buffered by what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I am nothing. I give away all that I have and deliver it up to be burned, but have not love. I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And for those in this room who are operating at a love deficit in any of those areas, Lord, I pray that right now you would change and transform their very hearts, that they would walk in all the gifts of the Spirit, that we might have the ability to love our neighbors as ourselves and love you first and foremost. We love you. We praise you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. Please be here next week.